of the underworld, particularly the Amduat, which is the, the, the classic one, become more generally available. And therefore, and what you also then get in Third Intermediate Period and later times, a composite uh, works, which contain bits of the, of the Book of the Dead, bits of the various books of the underworld. So the whole thing is a movable feast. And that's important thing to recognize that when we talk about Egyptian funerary belief, we're talking about something which evolves over a period of 3000 years. And the ideas come in and out of all that of that mix as time goes by. And here we've got the one well, of the earliest implementations of the Book of Amduat on the wall of the burial chamber of Thutmose III, which seems to be when the Amduat first appears. Interestingly enough, it also appears in a private tomb at this period and then disappears for private use until the third intermediate period. So it's a very, so that, again, how these uh, works are applicable to different types of person um, varies significantly. Okay, that's where we get that sort of the classic idea of what Egyptian funerals, funerary belief, what underpins it all. But what about the archaeological um, implementation of all of that? So here we've got in the very, very er well, the earliest forms of Egyptian burial from pre dynastic times, somewhere in the fourth millennium BC, we have these uh, graves with the body in a crouched position, surrounded by modest funerary um, equipment, um, vessels of food, uh, pallets and things like that. Also we see at this period body, some bodies becoming naturally desiccated which is generally assumed to be the basis for later the idea of developing a chemical form of mummification. And that mummification process when it comes into uh, its classic form again, again it evolves massively involves key things like removing of internal organs, at least for those who can afford the, the most sort of most spectacular version of it. Then desiccation by being buried in a mixture of salts for a period of possibly a month. Um, experimental work shows that you have to change that salt more than once during that period of time. Then the wrapping, and then finally the actual um, placement in the tomb. So a very, that's by, that's by the time it gets the New Kingdom, that is the classic way of it all happening. But there are plenty of, of mummies which are perfectly well preserved without evisceration and still some bodies owe their preservation to being put in the right kind of dry uh, environment. And Going back to what we were talking about earlier on about the whole question about the, the, the funeral being an important part anthropologically, well, the, the, the opening of the mouth ceremony, the revivification 
of the, uh, of, the, of the person. The ability to allow them to communicate again is the climax of that before the body is taken below. And this is a ceremony also carried out on statues as well. So there's a lot of, there's some, there's a things about a preserved body and a statue being very similar kind of things. The earliest examples of mummification are early dynastic period, um, early Old Kingdom, and this is an example um, in Bristol Museum. The body is still in its crouched position um, as it had been in pre-dynastic times, but it's now been wrapped in a plaster and resin soaked bandages. Unclear whether this one's actually had any kind of chemical treatment because it was preserved using, um, by the archeologists, using paraffin wax, which makes any kind of analysis of its chemicals pretty well useless, unfortunately. But that's how the mummy, the, 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 the mummy rather than the, uh, than the naturally preserved body first comes into existence. And then, of course, we have the culmination of that New Kingdom, early to the third intermediate period, where the process has reached its absolute apogee, and you are then able to, you know, with, with, with you and Chew, you, you've, you've certainly seen probably living people who look less healthy than they do. So that's what you can do once you've got to that very, very top level. But actually, these two are interesting married couple. Uh, died clear at different times and also possibly different places because while Yuya has had his brain taken out, Chu Yu hasn't. Um, which doesn't have done her preservation any harm. But it's an interesting case of here you've got some people who are the parents in law of a pharaoh and therefore would expect to find having just the very, very best, they've got a diff different techniques have been used between the two of them. And then what do you do with the body? Um, well, first of all, the bits have, you've taken out have to have something done with them and hence the development of the canopic equipment whereby you have got jars for the four groups into which the internal organs divided. Start off bottom left hand corner there being a very, very simple jar, just with an ordinary, you, know, you couldn't really very much like an ointment jar or other storage jars. But then as time goes by, by the Middle Kingdom, you have got human heads on them. And then by the later New Kingdom, you have these differentiated heads with each of the um, jars, the different um, head of the relevant genius. And then in many cases, a rectangular box in which they are placed. So the internal organs and the body in more general has these four genii who look after it, Imseti, Harpy, Quebec Senoef and Duamutef. And each of those is looked after by a goddess, Isis, Nephthys, Neat and Selket. So there's always there's a, there's sort of a, there's a team, of, there's a, protective, a core protective team who are always gathering around the body. And they're, some, they're supplemented by other deities as well, but these are the sort of the big four. And so they always appear on canopics. And the elaboration of canopic equipment, of course, varies with um, social position, with the top, of, the top level of all that, in the form of royal things and by the new kingdom you have the individual bundles of internal organs in solid gold coffinettes and they're placed inside an alabaster box like they were like the ones here from Tutankhamun's burial um, set up. As to what you the mummy looks like that changes over time we move from the um, crouched position at the beginning of the new old kingdom through to what we've got the top there whereby the body is almost in, a, in, a, in, in an at sleep um, pose with the one leg um, cocked over the other this would actually have been lying on its side and then by the end of the old kingdom and what the more classic mummy with its um, mask over its head and shoulders and the whole thing wrapped in a cylinder comes in and then the kind of um, decoration of the body then varies with time 
the mask is sometimes in, and there's a period during the third intermediate period whereby a bead net of the sort you see at the bottom comes in. But there's a huge variety of approaches and things can often be dated quite closely by the way that these things change um, over time. As far as the coffins which contain the mummy, um, their form very much depends on time as well. Uh, these early crouched burials, the, the coffins are there for short and fat, like this one. And then as the body stretches out, they become um, longer. But remember, remember, it's worth bearing in mind that the body lies on its side for a lot of time, right through until the second intermediate period. So therefore, to see out, coffins have eyes on the side. So the body is lying on its side with its face directly behind those eyes. Um, varying elaboration. Interestingly, the very simple one at the bottom there is a royal, royal example, although with lot made of cedar wood all exposed because that's a high status thing. The more elaborate one at the top there is painted, looks more fun, but actually the wood underneath is going to be a local wood and therefore they're effectively covering up um, the relatively poor quality materials on that. The masked mummy is the origins of the classic mummy case and the one at the top there of the 12th dynasty is really when the mask and the and the env en envelope almost merge so that you have there effectively it's a, a mummy in an extremely extended mask which you can tell because this lies on its side in, the, in a rectangular coffin and then in the second intermediate period the body flips over onto its back and the coffin the anthropoid shape rather than being simply an enlarged mask becomes a standalone container in its own right and the early ones are very interesting because they have wings on them which seems to be depicting the dead person as a bar bird. Remember the human-headed bird, which is one of the forms of the spirit. That's what that seems to be. And then we then have a succession of different fashions in the way that the coffin is decorated. Uh, the 18th dynasty, the idea of a seeming to be like looking like a masked and shrouded uh, mummy comes back in halfway through the dynasty the color dominant color becomes black and gold black being a color of resurrection because the egyptian belief is very much that resurrection has sort of is a is a reflection of what happens in agriculture every year the fields are covered with black um, silt by the annual inundation from which the first green shoots of the harvest come out so therefore that black is a color of resurrection as is also green and deities of resurrection can often have black skins or green skins because of that whole metaphor of agricultural growth Royalty ha often, as usual, has something a little more, more fancy. Um, the feathered approach actually lasts much longer for royalty and is implemented either in this glass inlaid um, fashion in Tutankhamun's coffin here, or is still engraved in the exterior of the, the coffin of, Su of Pasipkanu I or Susenis I. And in fact, he's still got this feathered winged approach to his coffin centuries after private individuals have given up and there's something to be there seems to be a certain degree of royalty hanging on to old-fashioned things after um everybody else has moved on in fact on funerary material it almost seems that the movement starts at the bottom of society rather than so it's bottom up rather than top down And in private individuals, say, while well, royalty is staying relatively, relatively still, things move on. There's a fashion for making your coffin out of, out of stone, although typologically it's identical to a um, contemporary wooden one. And then at the end of the 18th dynasty, 
there's a move towards the so-called yellow coffin with everything on a, a, um, a yellow background in polychrome. Uh, interestingly, the earliest example of one of these coffins comes from Daryl Medina, the, the um, village of the tomb workmen. And as such, um, that's, a, that's a, one of the reasons why it suggests it's people who are making these things who sort of generate new fashions rather than them being any, any kind of deep and meaningful top down um, approach to these things. Again, stone um, is also sometimes used, but also there's a short period of time where the person is shown as though they're alive, um, actually wearing that rather than the whole thing being mummy shaped and in some cases mummy colored. Um, now you'll get it, you get a short period, end of the 18th, early 19th dynasty, where you get people shown on their coffin lids wearing their daily life dress. And then there's a whole further set of changes in, in um, fashion early in the 22nd dynasty. Um, far less elaborately decorated in some cases, some of these coffins. And then there's a, wee, a short period where kings have bird heads. Um, quite what some of these, some of the, the meaning of these changes is unclear because though we, we, what we have are the changes, we can see what's happened but nobody ever bothers telling us why, they've, why these things have changed. And by the 25th dynasty, we have quite interesting where the nests of coffins, each level has a very different appearance. You can see here, the innermost coffin here is quite elaborately decorated in quite subdued colors. Then the middle one is still is, la is largely left as, as bare wood. And the outer one, very, very yellowy again, with lots and lots of detailed decoration. So fashion changes quite rapidly in the coffin world. Most people can only ever afford simply a coffin. Wooden coffin, if you're lucky, made of cartonnage or possibly even, even pottery in some cases. Top end of society, for most of Egyptian history, with a few exceptions like the New Kingdom, where it's not quite normal, can then have a stone exterior container, a sarcophagus, um, made either very simply, uh, one at the top there, or with a panel decoration, one at the bottom there. During the New Kingdom, it's only the very, very top, the royalty and a very few chosen other individuals who could have stone sarcophagi. Middle Old and Middle Kingdom, pretty well anybody can afford one can have one. But in the New Kingdom, that's not the case. And it's what examples we've got here, for the sort of people who do have them, the king himself at the bottom there, or the Viceroy of Nubia, who's the nearest thing to a king really, other than an actual king during this period. Ordinary individuals, even such distinguished individuals as the parents in law of a pharaoh, have wooden sarcophagi. Um, and we've got some examples there. Royal sarcophagi evolve over time um, during the Ramesside period. Having uh, um, the image of the dead king on the lid is, is in. Um, and when you have, and also around the same sort of time, private um, wooden sarcophagi have the same sort of colour schemes as the coffins inside them. So now they've moved to yellow um, on that previous slide, which are when it's fashionable to have black coffins, you also have a black sarcophagus on the outside of it. So these, these sort of these sets um, come along together. Sarcophagi then sort of evap differ, disappear after the New Kingdom. It's only in the late Third Intermediate period they come back again. And this is a typical private wooden example with the nested coffins inside, with the rather odd little, little figures of um, the mortuary god Sok Sokar in the form of a, a falcon, and Anubis perched on the lid and on the little corner point posts of these, uh, this thing as well. Other material which goes with the coffin very much varies over time. Throughout Egyptian history, a burial chamber is going to contain the coffin, possibly in a sarcophagus, along with 
um, canopics. But beyond that, it very much depends on period. During the Middle Kingdom, um, models like this, two models are standard in the burial chamber, um, which are three-dimensional depictions of the kind of uh, food production, which is a feature of the above ground chapels of the period, which I'll talk about in, in a moment. Um, and but then then these sort of evolve into far more stylized things, the Shabti figure, which is in some ways a magical servant of the deceased, um, which come in during the Middle Kingdom. Um, they reflect the idea that the next world is very similar to this world. Um, in the next world, you expect to have um, to, to, to have a very similar kind of thing in, you know, to the annual uh, um, agricultural um, cycle. And in this world, people can be called in to do work for the state in repairing dikes and all sorts of things you need to deal with the inundation. Well, in the afterworld, the same seems to be the case, but you don't want to have to do any of that. So therefore the Shabti figure comes along and the spell written on it says basically, oh, if Mr. or Mrs. X is called on to do work in the next world, you'll get up and say, here I am. So that's, uh, that's how the Shabti figure comes in. Starts off, you just have one of them. There's one of you, one Shabti. But then around the time of Amenhotep II, there is a, an explosion in numbers. And eventually you have a, a one for every day of the year or even more than that. So the, shab, the number of Shabtis takes off massively. Um, also, they become more and more mass produced, of course, as we move from having just you having just your one to having everybody to, to having a whole set of these things running into the hundreds. And here's just you can just see how the evolution runs over time. As far as the tombs which these bodies are going to go into, um, earliest examples, even the royal ones here at Om El Gaba de Baidos, are not anything much more um, than a tidied up version of your grave in the desert. So rather than simply being cut in the desert gravel, there is now a retaining wall of, of a brick to, hold, to stop everything collapsing in. And that's how these royal tombs kick off. Although as time moves on, they move from simply being that to starting to have the entrance stairways. There's a clear architectural evolution to be seen uh, with these things. And here they are out in the desert at Abydos, which from the fifth now, from the late Old Kingdom onwards, is associated with Osiris, who appears around that kind of time as, as the god of the dead. Prior to that, it's, quite, it's rather more unclear how the theology all was supposed to work. And here's sort of a couple of ends of the evolution, the relatively small tomb of Zhur, and then the much bigger one of Hasekenwi at either end of the early dynastic period. In addition to the king, you've also got these graves around the tombs, which are for the, the servants who have died at the same time as the king. And this sort of mass, presumably suicide, as far as we can tell, there's usually no obvious signs of, of um, violence on these. Interestingly, at the same time in Mesopotamia, we've got the death pits of Ur going on. So there seems to be a general thing around the early third millennium BC is the idea that a ruler can take many of his servants with him to the next world but that rap rapidly fizzles out and by the time you've gone from the great number of, of graves you can see here for Jur down to Kasekenwi, Kasekenwi's got no graves around his tomb at all, there are only two bodies in there which appear to be from these kinds of sacrificial um, burials. And here are those tombs um, shown um, exposed with Jur, just simply a fairly a, a rectangle um, with the walls faced in mud brick. Kasekum was a much, much more elaborate structure. And that kind, that's really where you see the, um, the direction of these things as you go through, as you sort of go, go through time, more elaboration insofar as economy allows that. 
And the important point of it is to also recognise is, which is true for all tombs from the very earliest points onwards, is that the tomb itself is closed where the mummy is and you know, apart from tomb robbers, nobody should go in there again. But there's always places required for interfacing between the two worlds. So above those tombs at Umel Garb, there are little chapels made up of two stele, which mark the offering place. But also a couple of kilometres away, there are much more elaborate elements, clearly belonging to the same tombs, which are great, great brick enclosures, which formed part of the funerary ceremonies. But exactly what role they play is less clear. But that dichotomy of offering place, monumental element and burial, all um, a present idea, the anyway, right the way through Egyptian history. Private individuals um, is an example of a tomb from the first dynasty again. Here the burial is carried out in a cutting in the desert gravel. In this case, underneath a bench-shaped paneled structure um, called a mastaba. In royal cases, it seems to be just to be a mound of, of, of rubble, not anything like this. Surrounded by servants, but there's no evidence that these servants died at the same time. Um, and the place where you interface between this world and the next is, is now is starts off becoming this little area here on the left hand side of the facade where later on a stealer appears and that turns into the chapel but here among for this private individual the monumental element the panelled mastaba the burial chamber and the offering place are all together it's really only royalty who can normally have the resources to have these split across the landscape And this sort of point of interface, the point where offerings can be made, are the, this is one of the earliest of these offering stele of a princess in this particular case, showing the deceased in front of a stylized um, table of offerings. And then around her, where in later times you'd probably have quite extensive few texts and spells, there are actually pictures of things she wants. There's clothing, there is food, there is drink and all these kinds of things. And that remains the key point about this interface point, the stealer. It is something which both is generates, can generate food, but it's also the place where real food can pass to the next world and where the spirit, the bar, can come out of this. The monumental element for kings becomes more spectacular at the end of the uh, Third Dynasty, where the first pyramid, the step pyramid of Saqqara, of, of Saqqara is produced. And not only do you now have, rather than a mound of rubble above the royal tomb, you have the set, previously separate element of the funerary enclosure is um, put around it. So rather than as at Abydos where these various elements have been kilometers apart, with the step pyramid, it's all brought together. So the rectangular enclosure, the offering place, and the burial place, and its covering are all in one place. And that's an important, apart from the fact it's also built of stone for the first time, this is an important part of the development of the whole process of royal tombs anyway. And also the step pyramid is interesting because it has a very elaborate substructure, unlike anything before or after it for that matter, which is actually also decorated as well uh, with um, tile, with panelled um, walls, actual reliefs of the king, something you don't find underneath, you don't find any kind of decoration under a royal tomb again for centuries. So step pyramid is very much um, an experimental thing. And there we've actually got here is the first, first royal uh, mortuary temple. Entered like in the past from the, from, entered from the east. And in, within this is where the entrance to the burial chamber lies. Evolution keeps going. During the third dynasty, they build stepped pyramids, 
What the step pyramid means is unclear. Now the texts tell us the idea it's a stairway to heaven in the words of the old song is a reasonable one, but we can't prove it. And then at the beginning of the fourth dynasty, the pyramid transmogrifies from a stepped one into a true pointed pyramid. And that evolution is seen at the Maidum pyramid here, built by King Snefru at the beginning of the fourth dynasty, begun as a step pyramid, converted to a true pyramid, and then collapsed or partly collapsed. Um, exactly what phase is unclear, but clearly they're trying to build th um, um, the pointed mantle around a, what was intended to be a standalone step pyramid didn't quite work properly. That transition to true pyramids is complete by the reign of his son Khufu and his immediate successors, who were the largest examples of the kind at Giza. What does the pointed pyramid mean? Well, again, no text tell us, but there's a hint that it's something to do with the sun and the idea that the true pyramid is the petrified rays of the sun coming down from the sky seems a reasonable one, can't be proved, but it seems not unreasonable. And particularly as it coincides where we know with an upswing in the, um, in, in the, in the, in the cult of the sun, because from the early third, fourth dynasty onwards, more and more people, including kings, have their names compounded with that of the sun god Ray, which hasn't been the case previously. So that all seems to fit in uh, rather nicely. But like with so many things to do with Egyptian funeral belief, we can't prove it. Once you get beyond the fourth dynasty, pyramids become very much more standardised. They become smaller, less well built, with much larger temples adjoining them. Uh, top one there at uh, Sahuray at Abu Sia with this huge mortuary temple you can see on the uh, on the um, east side of it. That seems that the mortuary temple is rather more, much more important than the pyramid and when one looks at later pyramids of the later old kingdom, middle kingdom, there's no attempt to go for the sheer wow factor of size which you've got during the fourth dynasty, rather we are now moving to a a much more functional kind of thing whereby it's the that is the overall machine it's not just with the pyramid with a sort of attacked on other things the overall machine um, is more important and the mortuary temple is a key part of that and when we get to the end of the old kingdom almost the classic um, pyramid complex has now evolved with on the edge of the desert the valley temple then a causeway leading up to the mortuary temple, which is against the east side of the pyramid. The pyramid with a very now a completely standardized interior layout behind that. And then small baby pyramids with the same sort of, with the same with, also with chapels and so on, um, surrounding them for uh, members of, the, royal, of, of the, the queens. That very simple interior layout then transmogrifies when you move on to the Middle Kingdom into more elaborate ones. The entrance for Kluipuzi for, ri for ritual reasons remained on the north face for generations, but eventually, presumably in the face of tomb robbers by the 13th dynasty, entrances can be on random sides. And in on the right of the, of, the, of the slide here, we've got one of the most elaborate of all pyramid interiors, um, which includes even dummy burial chambers, um, entrances to corridors, through sliding um, slabs of quartzite in the roof, all sorts of stuff like that, um, which um, you know, is, is really the culmination of the pyramid as a royal burial uh, machine. Interior wise, tend to be very, very simple until you get to the end of the fifth dynasty when decoration reappears on the interiors for the first time since the time of Djoser. 
And here you've got rather nice panel um, panelling around the area of the sarcophagus. But above it, you can see um, text, the pyramid text I mentioned earlier on, which are spread through the rest of the tomb. And then stars on the ceiling, starred ceilings go back to at least the third dynasty in tombs, because the tomb in many ways is a microcosm of the universe. So therefore, the, the stars of the sky are part of the same kind of thing. And in fact, as you go through, it's almost like a set of Russian dolls in that the tomb is a microcosm of the universe, but also the sarcophagus can be, and so can be the coffin itself. So you're all at times, you're, you're surrounded by cosmic levels. Back above ground, I already talked a little bit about the false door when we were talking about the car, but there, here is very much the classic one without the gimme, gimme, gimme figure um, at the bottom of it, which we had in that earlier one. But it's a, it's a stylized doorway. There's a panel with the, sea, the deceased in front of offerings. There is the doorway itself in the middle, very narrow, but that's it's still, it's still a doorway. And then there are the texts surrounding it, which are texts which are generally invoking the supply of food. Because that's the thing which a dead Egyptian is always terrified of, is to be hungry. And therefore, there is provision here for real food to be placed in front of this false door to pass through to the next world, but also the, if that if real food isn't provided, the texts on the on the false door will generate it. And to supplement that generation of food by the false door, if you can afford a chapel to surround your false door, well, the walls of that will have the same have scenes which are partly to do with food production and some which also evoke other things to want in the next world. So the idea is that that environment of the perfect Egypt, which produces uh, food, what you're gonna live in and so on and so forth, is all um, available there and evoked and magically produced. Because in Egyptian belief, if you drew something, you wrote something, it could magically happen. And that's what's going on in the chapel and the false door being on this side of the, uh, in, in this world, to supply, put supplies through into the next world. Those chapels, they of course have to be contained in something, very much depends on period and uh, topography. On a relatively flat site, like the in Memphite Necropolis here at Giza, the Mastaba tomb, now devoid of its panelling and now a much more solid kind of thing, will have its chapel inside it. But if you have got rather more hilly territory where a Mastaba isn't going to quite work, well, you cut your chapels into the side of the rock, as you've got here at Aswan. But the basic concept again remains the same. You have a chapel with a false door at the back of it. Things really change, importantly, where for royalty with the New Kingdom, where the pyramid suddenly is dropped. Um, after a thou over a thousand years of the pyramid being the thing to be seen dead under, they give up. This may be partly a further thing from the, from the security point of view, because a pyramid does say to a robber, well, here be treasure. But also with the Royal Cemetery moving from the north, which is like, which has got a lot of nice, flat, perfect pyramid building sites, it moves to Western Thebes, modern Luxor, where you can't, there's nowhere to build big pyramids at all. There's too, there's, there's too many lumps and bumps. And instead you end up with a new um, Royal setup with a memorial temple in one location, still uh, visible. And then on the other side of the hill, in a much more remote location, the burial chamber with no kind of obvious markings. The reason I've switched from the terminology of mortuary temple, which I was using for the things as joined in the pyramids to memorial temple, is that they have a rather different, although they're still intended to be part of the royal uh, mortuary setup, there's something, they've got a rather different um, 
concept. Because rather than being purely dedicated to the dead king, which the ones on the pyramids are, they're now dedicated to three uh, beings, of whom the most important is not the dead king, it's Ammon. Ammon is the, uh, has his chapel on the main axis here. Then Reharachti has his own open chapel on the right hand side of the axis and it's only over here on the left hand side of the axis that we have chapels for the dead king and also in some cases his or her in this case uh, father as well and this tripartite division with also various other sub 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 subsidiary chapels for other deities is keeps going for the whole of the new kingdom So you have this, this is the tripartite division. And although the architecture changes, this same tripartite division continues on into Ramesside times, with the best preserved example here being that of Ramesses III at Mednet Harbu. But these are the, almost the shop front for the actual tombs which are in the Valley of the Kings this valley behind there where initially the tombs are completely hermetically sealed you can't there's they intend to be fully secret after but later on their sites become slightly more prominent and there's a clearly a, a view that one can rely to some degree on police patrols because you want a rather more important impressive tomb the very early royal tombs have very small pokey entrances the, because of that, you can't get huge amounts of really impressive funerary kit in there. But of course, as time goes by, you want a bigger and better sarcophagus and all these things. But all of that goes with you actually having to lose the ability to completely hide the tomb. Um, the entrance becomes of such a size, you can't possibly hide it. And that's, so therefore, there's a, a clear division. So when looking at this photograph of the Valley of the Kings, these are the later tombs, which are really almost impossible to hide. The early ones are in these little corner nooks and crannies here, where actually they can be hidden. And archaeologically, you can see that because of the later tombs have never been lost. They've stayed stood open from antiquity after being robbed right way through the present day. The earlier tombs had to be rediscovered by archaeologists during the 19th and 20th centuries. And here we see the um, layout of the tombs underground. The style of the tombs of the Kings vary with time. The long um, straight ones are later New Kingdom. The ones which have got a funny bend in them here, here and here are all the earlier ones. But as you can all see they are much less impressive and this is what drives the kings towards less easily hidden ones, which of course brings back the whole spectre of tomb robber saying, well, I can see a tombs there. Um, and once, once the corruption and economic collapse of the late New Kingdom happens, you have um, wholesale tomb robbery. And also on the back of that, state-sponsored recycling of what's left. So these, and also this also ties in with the fact that the New Kingdom is the one time where funerary equipment becomes much, much more than sort of minimal stuff, which we were talking about previously, coffin, mummy, canopics, shabti, or things like that. You then start taking huge, all lots of, lots of furniture and things with you, all of which are exactly the thing which bring, which people who were coveted by either tomb robbers or later on extremely, um, skint state actors is what happens here. So therefore it is the one period of time when you expect to find really impressive funerary material in tombs, royal or private, is the New Kingdom. These tombs, the royal tombs of A the Kings, re resurrect decoration because we had pyramid texts of the late Old Kingdom, no decoration as far as we can tell in Middle Kingdom royal tombs, but then these books of the underworld I talked about earlier on are brought in during this period. Starting off under Thutmose III, 
And then as time goes by, the original one, Book of Amduat, Book of Wisdom in the Underworld, is joined by more. And by the time the last royal tomb to have a comprehensive decoration applied to it is created, to Ramesses the sixth here, um, you have got multiple books all sort of on the same kind of idea of what happens to the sun god at night but it becomes almost a nightmarish uh, mishmash of things and you do wonder what the priests were probably smoking when they came up with some of these conceptions of what's going on some of the weird and wonderful denizens of the underworld On the private side of things, um, this is the place to be seen dead in early in the New Kingdom. Basically, the hills flanking and behind the Royal Memorial Temples of the New Kingdom are where the chapels are. And, well, and you still have the dichotomy of a public chapel above ground with a burial chamber underneath, normally directly underneath the um, chapel, although occasionally it may be a distance away. And a few very, very favoured people had their chapels here, but their burial chambers were with the king in the Bay of the Kings. And down to the great sort of schism um, religiously of the Amarna period, you have um, decoration of these tombs, very much can't follow early practice, generation of food, things you want to do in the next world. A nice summary here in the Tomb of Nacht with the uh, fishing and fowling in the marshes at the top right hand corner, which combines getting things to eat with having fun and also possibly doing some ritual stuff as well. Bottom, you have uh, the um, making of wine, you've got the drying of, uh, you've got the salting. Of, uh, of duck, all those kinds of things. So all of this kind of food production, fun, is all there in the tomb of Nacht here, in the, cha in, in the chapel. The, just like the kings, this is a period where you could take it with you and here in the tomb of Ha, we've got on the left is the chapel and the berry baby pyramid, which that chapel is in because during the New Kingdom, kings have given up on pyramids, but everybody else then starts using them on a much, much smaller scale. And then here's the intact burial chamber showing not only the, um, the wooden sarcophagi, but also food, drink, and so on, all around the tomb as well. So this is a tip, this is sort of a, sort of a, a lower noble, upper middle class kind of burial. After the New Kingdom, after that period of conspicuous consumption, high income and everything else, things drop away. Royal tombs become much more poverty stricken during the much more poverty stricken third intermediate period. So rather than great galleries just jutting down into the bedrock, we have things like the royal tombs at Tarnis, which are simply little almost stone sheds um, in the um, grounds of the local temple. They would have been covered over with possibly some brick, brick um, chapels above, but nothing particularly spectacular. And these are sort of chapel you might, they might have been. These are stone examples a little bit later on, but probably something in brick along those lines seems not unreasonable. And then after the end of Egypt's independence during the Roman period, Greek and Roman periods, we find increasing um, admixture of other conceptions. And here's just a few of the mummy trappings which you find during the Roman period, ranging from things, uh, for example, one at the top there, which really stylistically doesn't differ much from something in the Middle Kingdom or even the Old Kingdom, through to the encaustic mummy portraits and other things which have got much, much more, much more of a sort of a, a um, classical European kind of feel to them. All of those still sort of built, built onto the old Egyptian um, belief system, but marking, say, a move away from, to a much more sort of um, cosmopolitan kind of approach to these things. So that brings me to the end of 
my talk. Now, has Sarah managed to find her way back to... Um... Yeah, I have. Ah, great. Hello, but you're hello back again. Aidan, thank you so much. I can't believe you took the reins on that. I thought that everyone was like out and I um, arranged a lift really quickly for my friend because the internet, the moment I pressed the button to let everyone in from the waiting room, just went. So very yes, people, you froze on screen. I know. And then, very my, my wife, then my wife, who's been watching it, was sort of came in and said, um, "It's all you're on your own." And uh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I said, "Well, okay. Clearly, you were having you were having problems." So I just thought I should get on with. Thank it. you so much. I don't know whether the first bit of your talk was recorded. Did you notice? I don't know because I didn't. I didn't press the record button. So okay. maybe it starts recording when I came back. But um, anyway, okay. I'll... No, I, wasn't, I wasn't quite sure what to do because I did. That, you know, I wasn't quite sure how you were planning it. So yeah. Very impressed. Thank you. <laughs> that was excellent, and thank you to everyone else for coming along as well. I've got a couple of questions, and I did miss the first maybe fifteen minutes of it, so I don't know whether you touched upon. We were talking in before the Zoom room opened about the car and the bar and that's yeah. there was a whole there was a bunch of slides on that right. specifically. Yeah. I was wondering about the relationship between the pyramid and the primordial mound and the idea of the pyramid mm. representing the primordial mound. I'd, my feeling is that the pyramid is the sun is, is is the sun rather than the primordial mound. Although it might because again, we can't. This is all wild guessing. Presumably, it looks now as nowadays anyway that the tombs of Omel Garb, the early dynastic ones, have simply a mound of sand and rubble above them. There's no mass to it; it's just simply that. And that one could think of as being a primordial mound. Now, the step pyramid is possibly a regularised primordial mound. At least it starts off as such when the original square stone structure is put over the tomb, which is clearly a direct link in from the early dynastic one. And then as it grows, it then possibly is still that, then there's possibly an idea of... St I think that actually sometimes the, 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 in this evolution, the ideas are changing as we go through to, as time goes on. I think the... I think that the, the transition from the step pyramid, which is still vaguely moundy to a, to a the true pyramid, I don't think the true pyramid initially can be regarded as a primeval mound. Mm -hmm. It's the wrong shot, you know, it's, it's clear so the symbol. But whether or not that then later takes on a secondary role as being also that. Mm. Well, I wonder not. whether the pyramid, especially when you look at it um, in the state that it would have been originally when it was encased, and the idea of the Ben Ben stone and the Bennu bird landing on the tip of the pyramid, whether it was a marriage of heaven and earth, a kind of expression of that. Possibly, thing. yeah. I think it's, it's, it's possible. The trouble is that nobody bothers to tell us any of this. Mm. I think no, we can see clearly see there's something there's simply solar about it. The, the Bennu bird also, you know, it does, is, is linked in with the primeval mound. But also the problem is a lot of these things is, because of this is the periods where we've got the evidence for these things mm -hmm. so half the issue i think is um whether we can legitimately make some of those inferences so there is clear that there probably is a link ultimately between the pyramid and the primeval mound but whether the true pyramid was actually that or whether it's a completely new a fresh start mm -hmm. and, the, and the primeval mound idea then comes back in again mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I just I think I just think that the, the, the because if you're looking at primeval mound, a pyramid that looks nothing like a primeval mound, it's too pointy. Whereas it does look like the Ben Ben stone, which is the fetish of sun god. Mm -hmm. And as I was, well, first pointed, I said first read in I think it was by Edwards mentioned this is that actually if you're at Giza on the right sort of cloudy day and you see the sun coming through the clouds. The, the cone or a, par, a half cone it's creating is almost exactly parallel to the side of the pyramid of the Giza pyramids. Mm -hmm. So therefore that 52 degree, 52, 51, 52 degrees does seem to tie in with nature mm -hmm. to produce that. Kind so, of like putting a point on the earth to which the sun can be attracted to maybe. Or, possibly, or alternatively, it's simply placing the king under the sun's rays. Yeah. And they can't be, they can't be much, more, much more sort of powerful than actually having your mummy resting under your own portable sun. Yeah. 
particularly given it's say when the pointy pyramid comes in is exactly the point where suddenly all the people's names start you know Khafre, Menkaure, um, Sahure, all of those mm. royal names suddenly they clear the sun is more important than it was previously mm. and there's also there's always been this sort of debate over whether or not there's originally a stellar destiny for the pharaoh versus a solar destiny yeah and you know it was suggested you know, long ago that the step pyramid is stellar whereas the true pyramid is solar we can't that, that's we, we can never we can't know whether that's the case or not but i think there is a change but it's quite possible that then if we move on the whole lot comes back to get in together because if you think about the you know the lack of coherence within the pyramid texts the pyramid texts conjure up about half a dozen completely incompatible concepts of what the king's destiny is so i think that by that time you probably are having almost a grab bag of possibilities the pyramid can be almost can be a whole range of things mm. But of course, now, now, now that there's no, we've got no sources which would tell us precisely what all that is. Mm. But I think you know one could one could guess at it, mm. and if you could guess, you could get our you know, you could, could drag in a, an Egyptian priest to try and explain all this. He might or might not. Maybe get a Ouija board out for the next. Yeah, week. but but that's the th those are sort of those I think those are sorts of things, and I think that the idea that by the end of the old kingdom, you've probably got a whole accretion of different the pyramid can mean different things different people um i think it may have been a little more clear cut when the conversion is done under under snefru mm -hmm. um one of the other things i wanted to ask you about and i i don't think i missed that bit was to do with offering tables and um some of the offering tables in the british museum i've noticed have like channels cut into them what were was liquid poured or some form of liquid poured? I didn't actually, I didn't actually, I was only talking about, I was only talking about four, I didn't actually talk about offering tables. Yeah, the idea is effect as far as we, as far as we can understand it is that if you pour liquid over a water over the offering table, the liquid then takes up the goodness of the various things you've put on it's like well, either the texts or the actual little carvings of food mm -hmm. and therefore what you've then got the water then can then be used as a further libation to the to the, to the deceased you know, that you've, so therefore when you pour the libation you're pouring all the nice good stuff which was on the offering table into that that's sort of how i sort of but again I mean, there's no there's no sort of handbook to how to use the mark one offering table that libation that i would go into a libation bowl rather than on possibly or you might actually simply pour it or you may just simply pour it onto the ground in front of the of the offer of the of the um false door we just don't really know um because you no know, you do get offering basins but they're not that common mm -hmm. um and you know how the offering table you know or whether it's simply because often the offering table is simply in front of the of the um, false door. You see, and, it, and you expect it to pour into the ground, and it will then sort of soak down into the. We just don't know. Mm. That's, the, that's the frustration. Is you know that, that one of the first things you know you, you always ask is why did the Egyptians do X, Y, Z? We haven't had a clue in most cases. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when people do pretend they know, it's they, I think they're probably fibbing. Um, you know, the, the various some of these various um, various colleagues who are really heavily into this i'm not sure i think they're going a bit too far sometimes as to, as to what you can legitimately infer from the actual evidence mm. you can come up with all sorts of great stories but unless unless you can actually get your ouija board out or then or bring in your your egyptian priest mm -hmm. it's all it's all it's all great it's all it's all great it's all great fun stuff but um yeah, we don't. We know. You know, we just we can't know. We can. We can. It's one of the fun, one of the fun things about dealing with an ancient, a dead civilization is that no, they can't. It can't answer back. You well, I was saying to you before, like I kind of like the idea. If I was a Egyptologist, I think I'd be well into speculating, so that at some point, if something arises in the future, a bit of documentation or an inscription, I would enjoy that moment of being like, yeah, I knew it. Yeah, it's interesting, but also there's sometimes the crushing defeat where. <laughs> on the historical things as well that you built up a whole a whole network of theories and then an inscription comes up which means it completely impossible 
in which case you've got to then sort of start from scratch again, which I had to do for something to do with the Amarna period on one occasion. I had to, you know, I'd been building up a whole scenario, which one discovery may completely collapse. And this I started writing a completely new book from scratch again. Mm -hmm. And also then had to start disowning stuff which I'd been writing over the previous years. And occasionally I've had people trying to argue my old position against my new position, which is <laughs> bizarre being cited against yourself. So um, one, I'll ask one more question and then I'll hand it over to everybody else. The, does the bar bird relate to Horus or um, is it just a bird representation to show the spirit flying on wings? It is, I, I think it's, it, it's unrelated to Horus, because actually it normally appears to be a vulture body rather than a, than, a, than, a, than, a, than, a, than a falcon body, although sometimes these various species become a little bit... I, no, I think it's more that, it's more that to be mo for, a, for a spirit to be mobile, it needs to be able to move, and wings are oh, the way to do that. Yeah, and also there's... Um, but also bear in mind that the actual the word, the other word for bar is actually written with a crane. A different, completely different, sick and different bird again. So I don't think there is any link between Horus and the bar bird as such, and apart the, from they're both between birds. Between the bar bird and the Bennu bird. I think they're, yes, yeah, they're linked. They're, they're clearly linked. I think because well, linguistically they are. Although um, when you look at sort of how they're depicted, it's a different sort of bird with the head. It's, I think there is, there is, there's got to be some kind of connections in there. But I, don't, I think that the connections are in that direction. But I think the, the clear point, I think, is that, though, that the idea is it's a, it's a mobile spirit, and if a spirit wants to get around, it's got to fly, therefore it needs wings. So I think that's really where, where it starts off. I'm sure there's lots of further speculation that gets built onto it once they sort of invent the bird. Yeah. You know, human nature is to elaborate. When you look at, for example, at things like canopic jars, they start off, it's simply a stone jar with a lid on it. It's a, you know, the same thing you could do with your, sort of, you know, keep your, your ointment in or whatever. Then somebody has the bright idea, oh, it wouldn't look pretty if it has a, has a human head on it. And then it's probably at that point then that they sort of start, then, then somebody sort of decides that the human head is the, well, the four sons of Horus. Then you later on have, you want to, dis to distinguish the four sons of Horus, they start having different heads. So I think there's a lot of this is something which starts off as a fairly straightforward idea and a practical idea so we can have practical things to do with sort of posthumous beliefs. You start off with something that's fairly straightforward and by the t in the old kingdom or middle kingdom, by the time you get to the late period, the whistles and bells are sort of you know are all over it, mm -hmm. and you're you're into completely different sort of which the person who originally sort of had this idea back in the old kingdom would com be completely gobsmacked at what his successors two thousand years later have done with that mm -hmm. but again it's, it's, it's you know you look at any kind of religion if you look at primitive christianity as far as we can make out what, what we know about it from sort of the early years ad to the elaboration of various modern of the various modern churches the schisms and all that kind of stuff i think human beings tend to want to do that kind of stuff although occasionally you do see what seems to be a hang on we've gone too far folks and there's a reset um, you know, 22nd Dynasty coffins become less manic in their decoration. Is that kind of what uh, Akhenaten was doing as well? With well, he's yeah, well, he's yeah, he's yeah, he's he's resetting as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and in fact, after Akhenaten, you know, that resetting continues. They that the Ramesside. And I didn't have any, and that was a very, very brief overview I guess sort of gave there. In fact, it was a potted version of normally a whole uh, one term university course. So, um, but in all of that, there's that after he resets, then they reset again. And no, post Amarna tomb decoration is nothing like, well, at least from, from tomb chapels, is nothing like pre Amarna. So every so often they do reset. Sometimes it's for simpli it simplifies. In some cases, it simplifies to then go mad again almost immediately afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. I'm going to read through some people's questions here, and then once I've done that, I'll take a. Um, you should be able to take yourself off mute. So if you want to ask any questions yourself, you can do. So uh, let's see what we've got. Uh, so um, Alexandra asks, A, why did we stop burying? 
people on their sides and the black equaling resurrection is this an explanation behind the black goo that's seen on some mummies on the first one why they slip up i think it may be because during the second intermediate period which is when they flip back onto, onto their backs it's a period of poverty you can't afford your nice sort of you know because previously what you'd had when you would had an anthropoid coffin you had your anthropoid coffin inside your rectangular coffin on its side if you can only just about afford that a coffin an anthropoid coffin you can't put it inside something and laying on its side without protection so there i think for practical reasons it, it flips over onto its back for that reason and once you then economy allows things um it stays that way um the on the spot of the black i think actually bl that, that, that black goo and all that i think that's all to do all linked in with that some of that black goo probably has come preservative effects but i think the fact it's black resurrection and all that rein, under, re reinforces why you do it um what's the difference between black goo and bitumen is it a totally different uh, no, well bitch <laughs> This is quite a lot. Bitumen is only very rarely used by ancient Egyptians. Bitumen is really something that comes into more use later on in sort of Ptolemaic and Roman times. Bitumen is can be a component of black goo. I think that's the reason why the term the uh, that this very deep and meaningful term black goo has been developed. It because half the time, unless you actually analyse this stuff, you're never quite clear. It's a mixture of resins and bitumen is a resin so yeah black goo is sort of and i think the composition composition of that black goo varies over time also there is some question about whether it's all whether sometimes at least initially it was intended to be black or it's gone black over time so yeah it's a the whole black goo in goo question is a quite a lab, an elaborate one but i think the fact it's black helps is a major help for it's sort of it, it's almost it's almost a question of you know, like you know with medicines if it's a funny color it may well do you more it, it's probably gonna do you some more good because it's a funny color i think if something's pepto black bismol. it's like black goose the pepto bismol of ancient egyptian mummification yeah, yeah I, th I think basically if something's black it probably means it's going to be good for a dead body okay uh swati asks how were these bright colors given to the coffins what kind of pigments did they use it's basically earth pigments most of them are earth pigments so therefore your yellow is ochre your red is ochre the black is lamp black the only ones which they have to do a bit more to do is producing blues and greens which is again it's going to be ores of that kind of color ground up and then bound but they're much more difficult to bind so it's quite interesting when you look often look at a, um, a coffin seeing the differential preservation the earth pigments are still as good as they were the day they were put on there but often your blues and greens will have dropped off be now a muddy black and so on so generally speaking it's earth pigments with again using natural materials as far as possible so you say, so say so copper various copper ores and things to produce your blues and greens and with those you've probably got you basically got your whole your whole palette with mixing up from those are there many things that uh, we think are extinct, like plants and things like that, that existed and were plentiful in ancient Egypt that don't seem to exist anymore? Most of them say they all still seem to exist, but necessarily in Egypt. The classic one is papyrus, which has now retreated way, way into, into Sudan. Is there still a clump of papyrus outside the Cairo Museum? Yes, there's still. It's, the last time I was there anyway, it's still in the ponds there. Mm -hmm. And also there's enough, enough papyrus shops and whatever with them in the corners. So they're back in Egypt, but there's, there's nowhere they grow, grow, grow wild anymore because you haven't really got sort of the slightly sort of the sort of swamp since the, the 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 aswan dams and so on you haven't got that kind of places where you'd expect yeah. to find natural papyrus thickets i did buy some papyrus seeds online actually and tried to get my dad to grow them and put them around his pond but my uh, niece ruined them all and chucked all the dirt on the floor but they were starting to sprout so i'm going to get some more of those and whether um, whether they would survive a british winter i'm not sure I, they could survive a Bex Hill winter, definitely. <laughs> um, Gertie asks, how come the condition of the wood it, of the coffins is so good? It's simply dry, uh, because the, when it's got dry conditions, things will last forever, to wood. 
it, it, but the moment you get any kind of humidity, it becomes much more horrible. To, at Luxor, we're pretty lucky that, apart from when, on occasions when there have been floods and things have penetrated in, things, but somewhere like where the water table is higher, like around Saqqara, like preservation of wood in tombs at Saqqara is vile. Um, some of you, some of you who's watching may have seen the um, Swansea lecture by um, Ramadan, Ramadan's lecture on the Sayite tombs and the condition of, they were found completely intact. You see sort of what looks like a coffin, but it's actually a mass of, 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 of dust. You know, it, it holds its shape until a bit of more air comes, it goes, collapses. So it, those are the ones there, they're all from Luxor, all from Thebes. At sufficiently high levels of elevation, they're far enough away from the water table. Uh, the moment, uh, but again, even at Luxor, when you've got things at the bottom of the hill, close to the water table, you get far poorer preservation. It's just lucky because it's so hilly that they tend to put things well up. And I'm sure the ancients took that view as well, that they want to keep things on a high enough elevation because they knew that if you get water anywhere near these things, they're gonna, it's not gonna last. Okay, um, Stephanie asks, can you give me your best definition of the ack and the shadow? No. Um, <laughs> well, ach means effective spirit. So it means, it, going from what it means, it implies it's a form of the spirit which can actually do something for you. It looks as though, again, if, again from looking at some of the cases where achs are mentioned in texts, that they can, inter, they can sort of intervene on your behalf in the beyond they're the sort of one who might be able to go and speak up for you with the god that looks sort of what they mean because that the ach ikka effective the effective 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 spirit so it looks like it's, they, they can do things for you and as far as i can see they can do things for you in the beyond the shadow we don't really understand the shadow we know it exists but what the hell it's for i think it's simply it's simply reflecting the an understanding that you've got to identify all the component bits of what makes you a living human. The fact that when you die, you split into these various things, and that the shadow is obviously recognised as being something to do with you. But it doesn't seem to have much, there's nothing I've managed to really ever, ever really come across which explains what it does or whether it does anything at all, apart from the fact it's simply one of the things which is in the beyond, which is once a component of your living, your living self. Does it have some relationship to the sun? No, it could do, but we've got no, there's no basis to go on. It's mm. simply, I don't, I'm not aware of it ever being sort of sighted. This, it's a, the, the, this shadow is something which is occasionally is sort of mentioned, is occasionally, to, but, occasionally depicted but not to a level whereby we make anything out about what it's all about. Okay, um, Arthur asks why would a step pyri uh, pyramid have stellar associations? It wouldn't, that's the point, that's I'm saying that the step pyramid is the one which doesn't, the pointed one does. The step pyramid I think effectively probably starts off as a pen, a time, attempting to produce a more solid primeval mound than a mound of rubble uh, it doesn't it, represent steps traveling up to the stars. Well, it might do. It might do. Um, there are there are texts. So there's one pyramid text which talks about a ladder being laid down for the ascending king. Whether that is an allusion to a step pyramid or simply we're just reading too much into it. Or so, hashtag. I'm not saying it's aliens. Yeah, it's that sort of it's that sort of level of of things that. We think, yeah, that could be it, but whether they were thinking that, anybody's guess. But no, the step pyramid is the thing which is none. It's not, there's no evidence of step pyramid anything to do with so. It might be to do with Stella. Well, that's, 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 that's only that's that's because that's that's I said. I thought that's why I said St Stella Pyramid. Oh, Stella. I think you, you said Sola when you were reading oh, Arthur. Sorry, I meant Stella. Oh, yeah. no, <laughs> it's, 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 it's simply it's a dichotomy because if, the, if there is, and if, if there really is this dichotomy between Stella and Solar, and if the, the true pyramid is Stella, by definite by elimination, step must be Stella. Yeah. That, that's, yeah. me, that's as far as that's that's the that's the last way the last the that's the level of logic. Step pyramid Stella. Got it. Okay. Uh, 
Um, Dorothy asks, would kings buried in tombs decorated with the Book of the Dead or similar texts know the contents of such texts before they died? Well, kings don't have the Book of the Dead. The Book of the Dead is a private... Well, there are little bits and pieces of the Book of the Dead appear in some royal tombs, but it's not a standard. It's, it, it, you don't have the full... That's the, that's the big dichotomy in the um, 18th and 19th dynasties, which is that kings have the underworld books, everybody else has the Book of the Dead. Would people... Just assume you're, you're, the, you're you, as a dead person. I suspect some dead people would know what, was, what it was all about. Others probably just did it because that's what you did. Don't think um, people were like particularly bad in one area. They might be like, oh, "I better make sure I get that chapter." Because it's certainly the Book of the Day, the, whether it be the um, papyrus version or the version or a version on the wall. No two tombs have the same combination. There's sort of some which everybody has. So there's, there's, it looks like there is a degree of of choice. You know, you can actually go and. You know, go through the spell book with the you know if you're if you're ordering yourself a papyrus, you know which what, what do you want? What would Sir or Madam want in there? Kind of like a wedding wedding planner type situation. Sort of, sort of thing. But whether but I would suspect that there are some people who probably really really are into it and say you know I you know, I do actually and I I want that specific sort of you know version six a. Al delivering the scroll. But, but, on, but on the other hand though, is there somebody others will just say just give me a nice pretty one. Yeah. You know, I can, I can like I, there's, there's a degree of it's going to be how many how many cubits long can you afford because you've got some books of the dead which go on for miles, or you know, not quite, but you know, for, for, you know, for sort of hundreds of a hundred meters or more. Mm -hmm. Others which are you know much much shorter, and some which are a bit of are, 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 um, a combination of book of the dead, a bit of Amduat, a bit of gates, and sort of. So I think that it depends on the individuals. There are some who are going to be into it, really think carefully about what they really want, what they think is important, possibly in, you know, in conjunction with their spiritual advisor. Others will simply say, well, I know I need one. Just give us a, you know, I can, I can afford, I can afford so many Deben. Yeah. Give me, give me, give me your best one, your best six deb in Book of the Dead. There are like particular chapters that people kind of can't do without that you kind of have to have. Well, I, th I think, yeah, there are. I think normally 110, which is the actual one to do with the actual being in the next world. There's the ones which are to do with the judgment are, are always in there. Um, there's a, there are certain ones like that, which are, which, are, which pretty well every, every copy has got. But then... But within that, there's sort of variations on the theme. Of, you know, some of those is more than one version of some of them. Some of those versions are chron have chronological implications, but other ones it may just be what your you what, know, what 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 the poetry in your soul wants for for these things. Um, so yeah, and I think there's a big difference. Say some people it, they're really into it and it, and they really really others they simply want one. Okay. Uh, Judy asks, were the rituals the same for children, i.e. the weighing of the heart? No idea. Mm. Uh, I don't think, you know, the papaya we've got are all for high state individuals. Um, I'm not, a, I, I don't, I can't think that there may, if there is a book of the dead for a child in existence. Mm. Um, there might be, but I'm not. That's you know. There's a, there's a whole there's a whole bunch of people who do the Book of the Dead, um, mm. who might well know whether there is one. I can't. I don't think I ever seen a child's one. I say. Okay. Um, uh, Diana asks, how many graves do we know of that have subsidiary burial at the same time, and would this have included the wife or just servants? Right. Basically, what you've got are the ones with subsidiary barriers are effectively all that bunch of Abidos. I think it's what, eight or nine, I think. Is it, I, don't really remember, I think it's eight, is it eight tombs. At, it's the, anyway, it's the, it's the first dynasty ones at Umm El Garb, which have got, have got them. Some of the people who are buried there have got titles which later on are to do with being a wife. Um, but whether they are wives, concubines, or whatever. Um, so yes, it's again. It's it's quite it's, again, because you're trying to understand what some of these titles actually. Mean. There are some which may they actually may be sort of let's say bed companions of the king, 
uh, as well as servants and possibly people of reasonably high status within the household. Um, not official as far as one can tell, but you've got quite a, you know, it's quite a lot of the you know, quite important people around who are close to the king seem to go with him. Okay, we've got like 16 questions. There's loads and loads of questions coming up. So let me um, Arthur says, could the depiction of a, a black cutout character not represent the shadow, but symbolize an absence, something missing from the composition of the person until the parts are reunited? Um, could be, but there's absolutely <laughs> no evidence to go on. No, the, 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 the shadow, I think it's something that is labelled as a shadow as well. But um, this is a trouble, the, the whys and wherefores, one can come up with all sorts of will and unfairs, but unless it's actually a text which, com which confirms it, it's sort of, yeah, nice idea, but... Um, uh, Alia asks, when Anubis is seen leading the deceased, particularly in weighing the heart scenes, what exactly is he leading? Is it a specific soul? Is it all the souls together? Is it just an image suggestion of the dead in the same way Greeks have idolons? Oh, good question. Not sure. I, I, I don't, I think it, it is, I think it is norm, the, the label is normally of the, you know, the, the, the name of the person. So I think it might be there for, the, for that pur purpose. They may have all been brought back together again, possibly. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure if I've seen, I've ever seen a, a full, any real discussion of that. Interesting point. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, it is the person in their, in their whole form rather than in one particular sort of atomized bit of them. But that's an inter inter interesting question. Okay, uh, Rufus asks, uh, he's got two questions. Um, with regard to black representing resurrection, does this mean a metaphor? Um, does it mean eternal life in the afterworld or does it mean actual reincarnation? There's no evidence that they believed in reincarnation in sort of the sort of Tibetan, that sort of, that sort of mode. Um, it may, I think that everything to do with the with what we know about Egyptian afterlife is all to do with living in the fields of Yaru in the beyond, in the beyond. So it's all to do with being reborn there. It's to do with sort of being, you know, effectively being dead here and then going through the almost natural process of, re, of rebirth and regrowth through the metaphor of, the metaphor of, of growth. You know, I, I think, where metaphor ends and where sort of actual belief in what happens begins is a bit of a bit of a grey area. Well, they went to great lengths to make the body last as long as possible. So. Yeah, because I think the whole point is that the idea is that those elements which the body splits into, which I start, which I talked about at the beginning, the body is part of that, mm -hmm. and I think it's the body is the one is the thing which still anchors. You're still anchored to the earth in some way. You're sort of um, there's there's always there needs to be a bit. You need to have one one foot on the earth, ideally. Does it kind of reference an idea of an eternal sleep in some ways as well, or maybe there might even be a dream aspect to? You know, there's nothing, nothing in the, again. That's why it's, as I as I've sort of stuck record to be honest. There's nothing in the text which really helps us on that mm -hmm. precisely what the nature of what the body is you know, the body is important hence the reason why you have to preserve it etc etc um but then there's clear hierarchy of that in the sense that the you know ultimately you're not gone until your name's gone yeah so i think it's a question of being sort of you know f you're in full fettle if all the various bits are still there mm -hmm. provided this this all you know, your, your name is on the, le on the on the lips of the living that mm -hmm. level of that's that's the whole point and there's there's also there's the old you know, one of the one of the texts effectively sort of summarizes write a book and live forever because people yeah. are li reading your books but they're they're, they're, sit there, they're reading and saying your name well that um makes me think about this idea that they had of the of statues possessing some sort of living essence and the no smashing of statues to stop them from yeah, because it, because because yeah, a spirit, which probably the bar can can inhabit things, mm -hmm. 
Um, and again, sort of like having an image of somebody. Again, they, they, I think the, the, idea, the, the idea is that a person is a combination of a whole range of different spiritual and physical things. Mm -hmm. And that you really need to have all of them intact to have a full and, full and varied afterlife if things start getting eaten away at by your nose being smashed on the statue, your mummy being broken up and all those things, it's degrading your abilities. But I don't think they ever, they will ever sort of, they ever explain what that actually means. It's just there's this general feeling you want the whole lot to be mm -hmm. full. Is there any, um, any inscriptions or any writings that describe bits of uh, the spirit going astray like a, a loose bar bird for example i don't think so no it's all all this stuff is fairly all this stuff is fairly um stereotyped you know the sort of literature we're talking about is basically the book of the dead and related things and they're all pretty you know there may well have been the thing is there, there may have been other sorts of literature but where you'd find it that's the you know the, the sort of this sort of, the sort of non stereotyped funerary stuff which we've got is things which are found ended up in waste paper at Cahoon, um, the odd Ostrakhan at Daryl Medina and things like that. So unless somebody in one of those places happened to record some, I'm sure there were lots of little of stories and things around, but why, but trying to get hold, but you know, they're, the likelihood of them being preserved mm. is, you know, is problematic. Um, you know, it's you know, a, a bit of papyrus could turn up with something interesting, but generally speaking, it's all fairly, fairly safe for fairly sort of more, more of the same. Okay, so Rufus's other question was Do we have much evidence as to time scale uh, tomb robbery? Um, was it immediately after the tomb was sealed? Was it a few years later, a few decades, or a few dynasties? And is there any evidence of any sort of guard or protection for tombs? Right. I think it varies very considerably with the what's going on politically and economically. Um, the, the period where we've got the evidence for mass tomb robbery is when there is collapse, both political and economic. During the late Ramesside period, it's all going horribly wrong in all sorts of directions, and the tomb robbery um, follows on with that. We're aware that the tomb of Thutmose the Fourth was robbed sometime during or after the Amarna period, possibly when the, um, the royal necropolis had been shifted to Amarna, possibly. Um, we've got a couple of it, we've got examples of white inside jobs with the tomb actually robbed at the time of the funeral, mm -hmm. whereby the tomb has been found by archeologists sealed and inside is a smashed up mess. Mm -hmm. You've also got examples of whereby a, an intact coffin has been found you open the lid and the inner coffin has had its gold bits chopped off. Mm -hmm. And then when you get to the mummy, you found it's actually been robbed in the embalmer's workshop. The outer shroud is perfectly intact, but then when you move the shroud, you find things have been torn up and they've just... So I think tomb robbery depends on, on circumstance. Uh, there are plenty of completely venal um, undertakers and so on, who if they think they can loot things before while well, the family's on their way home to the you know on the on the way home they might well do so i think in most cases where people who are dishonest if they're in a circumstance they can get away with it they will do and that and the ability to get away with things gets much much more when you've got civil and economic problems when people are far more interested in other things than worrying about the tombs when actually you've got bandits sort of no, no, murdering people in their beds and so on. So I think there's a, it, they, the time scale depends. But I think if there's, is even at the best of times, if the if a tomb robber thinks there's a way in, he will probably take it. I but, guess that really points to um, just how some people didn't take the threats of various demons and punishments by gods very seriously. Yeah, I think, but also, I suppose it's also a question of there's always a de varying levels of belief, and sometimes greed um, trumps everything, and I think that's probably what what happens. And also, also sometimes need. You know, if people, particularly if you're talking about periods of economic and and social collapse, 
quite honestly, you know, you you you, you need you need if you could to live, you, there are people sometimes need to steal to live. Yeah. And stealing probably that may have been taken for you taking stealing from the dead was less bad than stealing from the living. Mm-hmm. Okay. Shayla asks, did, since they took such care to make bodies last, is there any evidence as to why they made sure Akhenaten was not mummified? I'm sure he was mummified. We know he was mummified because his canopic, you know, all the all the all the equipment was there. My view is he was he was he was burnt sometime after his death. So Akhenaten, there's no all the evidence is Akhenaten was mummified, and as 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 he as a as a king would be. Um, it's only later on his mummy is probably destroyed. Okay, Lisa, uh, carrying on from that question, says, did people start to acquire funerary items throughout their life or was it up to the family to provide when they died? It was very much a bottom drawer kind of approach. Um, clearly, I think it's really pretty clear that you sort of, when you could afford it, you were putting the stuff together. You built your tomb during your lifetime. Um, you and would then have built up the built up material for it during your lifetime. Um, the ideal was therefore the very mini because I think they generally people took the view that you couldn't trust the new generation to actually do anything. Um, so you did it all as far as possible in advance. It's in, it's like not, looking forward to death. Well, no, it's just what it's, just, it's, just, it's not just looking forward. It's simply just while that it, death is part of life. So therefore, you were, therefore you um, deal you, you prepare for it. But was it seen uh, as being like a greater experience than living? I'm think? not sure whether they. I think they wanted they, a better way of looking at it is they clearly wanted life to continue on, and therefore, according to their belief, if you did all this properly, um, you, you, know, you 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 would get eternal life. So therefore, you did what was necessary. I know it was. I think it was it was about. I think, I think there's also. I think there's less of this of the. Um, compartmentalization of things than we have for them de- you know, they, they, they recognize a death was as i think people pre-modern people generally do because death is all around you you know for if you're a woman the likelihood of more than half your children surviving you is you know, so therefore it's something which is happening every day and therefore you need to deal with it and therefore the average lifespan of a person in ancient Egypt like I suppose it's different at different periods but yeah and I think also probably as an average is a, is, a, is, a, is a very helpful thing because you've got a huge, very large infant mortality you've probably got high maternal mortality you've probably got quite a high young men mortality if they're in the wars and things they, you know, we're looking at it there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to live to 80 or 90 mm-hmm. So, so, so saying an average it implies you've got lots of people all dying in their thirties. Actually, that's probably not true. Mm. It's that's a danger. That's a danger of of averages. Median deaths, mm. de- age of death is probably more useful. But also, you may then want to exclude certain. You know, so I think I, I'm always very nervous when so well, no, average age of death was thirty something. Therefore, everybody was dead by thirty. Uh, no, it doesn't mean that at all. It means lots of people are dead before they're ten. Mm. If a lot, quite a lot of women are clearly probably dying in their twenties or thirties or early forties in childbirth. Because if you just because if you start, yeah, if you look at sort of even high states, if you look in sort of medieval history, look at the Habsburgs, the number of princesses who are dead in their thirties from child from childbirth. But it all skews things horribly. Yeah. Whereas you've, you've still got plenty of people, plenty of heart of hale and hearty seventy and eighty year olds. Yeah. So it's. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a it's a problematic one, and I think people often don't quite grasp what it actually or what it really what yeah okay. age profiles really mean. Um, Alexandra asks, did the ancient Egyptians have ghosts, the unrestful dead, if they didn't get their offerings? There is a there are ghosts. Quite why they what why they are ghosts is un, sometimes unclear. There are a few ghost stories about sort of people meeting a ghost and having a chat with them and things i think but some of them seem to be perfectly happy it's just they've sort of come back over and are taking an interest um in so i, don't, I think that i don't that there, there, that there is a concern about the about bad ghosts or bad spirits because you get that you get letters to the dead being written which mm. are sometimes some of them are hey 
or you know, can you can you put in a good word with me with the great God because I'm trying to you know do something or other. Others are no, please don't sort of disturb me and you know, and things. That's and the whole thing about this in dreams and that um, dead people would visit you in dreams. There is that, but I think there's also there's a con there's a concern about certain de the dead who they want to remain dead. And there's a particularly not odd one to do with the high priest Pinagem the first where his second but first deceased wife, there are some very odd dec amulet decrees written for her, Nessa Khonsu, which suggests that um, they hadn't been on good terms before she died. And there's a concern that she is going to do something nasty from the beyond. Mm. So the dead have got to be looked after. The dead can be friendly, helpful people, they can be not. So presumably if they've not been looked after properly, if they've not had their, had their offerings, they might decide to be a little bit um, tricksy to you. Uh, again, this isn't all, this is all you've got to you infer this from various sort of texts. But I think, I think we can have motor scientists, I think, you know, that, who believe in ghosts, that ghosts have sort of uh, a bit of a double-edged sword. They can be kind of friendly ghosts who are going to help out and talk to the spirits for you and things like that. Or there may be the bump in the, the, the things that go bump in the night kind of ghost mm -hmm. who might then sort of be not be such a good thing. Okay. Judy says, um, what mystery attached to this subject would you like to uncover next? Gold. Um, I think the problem is most of it is actually mystery in the sense that we don't know the actual reasons for things. It would be nice to actually understand, from the point of view of funerary stuff, is actually really understand what the, the division of the spirit actually means in practical terms. That's something that's always been a bit of a, you know, the car and the bar make sense. What the rest, what the rest of them are, are doing is a bit more problematic. So that's, that's from the point of funerary evidence that we probably all would like to, under, I'd like to understand. Is, is car something that you you would celebrate it in life as well as death? It was something that was thought to be part of you as a living being as well. No, there's no evidence for it. It does seem to be it's something which only sort of which is separate from you prior to being born, and it only ever can, it then splits off again when you die, mm -hmm. along with all the other bits. So I don't think there's any evidence that the car of yourself. There's things to do with the royal car, which is a slightly different kettle of fish. When when you start talking about, there's something about there there there, there is. Um, offerings to the royal car, cult, even sort of quasi cults of it, but it's but it's, it's not necessarily the royal car in the sense of the normal car. Yeah, you follow me. Yeah, um, it, it's the the the, the 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 king. The king has got a rather different spiritual physiology from everybody else, and his car is a different thing, which has some which does things during his life, but quite what is a bit more problematic as I know I know out is always it's all a bit problematic but that's the case you know, we, we we sort of understand there's something going on in a certain area but quite what that means in practice there's some nice words what help those words really mean mm. um in practice in, in in practical terms and half the time i'm not sure even sure that the ancient egyptians quite knew either mm. i think some of this stuff had been as I, as I was saying earlier on these things sort of build up and accrete over time and what starts off as a fairly straightforward bit of bit of doctrine by the time you've added a bit of poetry and a bit and a few and a few th a few hundred years of of you know of, of bits of priestly speculation mm. you've got to you know what on earth does this mean does anybody know what it means is there a chance that some of the spells and incantations in the Book of the Dead were like ritual scripts that involved some performative aspect? There's a suggestion that that is the case. Certainly that there's something to do with, you know, in, in, during some funerals, you might have a performative thing on it. The idea, there, there's clearly the idea that there's sort of mis the mystery plays of Osiris and so on may have included this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the fact that the opening of the mouth is a performative thing as well as being something scriptural. The fact the possibility that some of this is actually played out, particularly for high status funerals, 
I think that's, that's, that's often what we've got to bear in mind is some of this stuff could be if you were sufficiently, you know, you were, you've left enough money to be able to pay for all these, at least these, these troops of, of dropping actors to do all this kind of stuff. And you can pay some women to wail as well. Well, I think that's the whole point. Your, your sort of minimum requirement is, is, is to pay, is to pay off your mourners. Mm -hmm. You might then have a bunch of people playing at play acting other things as well. Mm -hmm. If you could, if you could afford it, mm. you know, you, 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 you're waiting women, your mood dancers, and there's there's that sort of, and, and I'm sure that the performance can go on as far as you your your um, how much you know how much how much resources you're leaving behind to to mm. fund it. Mm. Uh, though though that I hand those out, that the, the, that they sort of the waiting women, the mood dance, and so on are what you see depicted on two walls, which suggests that is probably the standard level of performative mm -hmm. performativity, whatever the word, whatever that word is. Um, Lisa asks, with regard to funerary texts, if a person couldn't read in life, would they be able to read the text after death to invoke the spirits, the spells rather? Good question. Um, or whether or not the fact these, these spells exist would just sort of come upon them. Because there's this whole there's a whole question about a, te a text being a concrete thing, so whether actually having your scroll, if you can't read it, it will speak to you, rather than you having to read the thing. Kind of activated in the art of producing well, it. Possibly, yeah. but again, this is again, I have to recognise that this is not based on anything the Egyptians say. It's simply speculating on how it might work, um, and that this is, this is some of the dangerous thing. If somebody's got professor in front of their name says something. It's no more of a or less of a guess than it's somebody who hasn't. <laughs> it's just that you know it, the number of thing, the number of factoids in Egyptology which come back ultimately to Maspero, because he you know he was the great you know he, he was the great professor of Egyptology of the late nineteenth century, and it's amazing how many things actually when you try and scrape away the surface of things Eddie Fool knows about ancient Egypt actually was something which Maspero sort of made up. Yeah. So I always get out say to students is always make sure you go back to where where did this come from? Trace something back to what is the first article or book which says this? Yeah. And did it was it actually based on anything other than hmm, seems like a nice idea that. Yeah. And often you'll find it is, hmm, seems like a nice idea. But then you know, 150 years later, this is a fact. It's only often somebody, when somebody's picked up, you know, is doing a PhD or something, which is the first time anybody's looked at in any detail ever. Yeah. They suddenly realise that what we thought we was a, had been a fact for the last 150 years is a complete utter, utter tosh. Yeah. Um, Alia asks, were there any legal restrictions recorded with regards to funeral ceremonies in the same way there were in Athens, i.e. just for a certain amount of people for a certain amount of time? No, no evidence of that at all, no. There's, there's no sumptuary laws as far as I'm aware as, um, from, from Egypt. Okay, I think... I've, got, I've got to the end of my questions now that um, are typed up in the box. So I would just like to thank you so much, Aidan, for an absolutely fascinating um, afternoon of talking about the ancient Egyptian world of the dead. It was so fantastic to have those questions answered and people asked great questions. It was really nice. So if anyone does have any final questions, I don't want to keep you for too much longer, but um, maybe a couple more questions. If anyone has them, you can take your mic off. But thank you so much. It was really, really great. I'm sorry about my technical hitch in the beginning, but I'm glad we all got, got it yeah, going. At least, at least you left me in control. Because, no, that was great. I was so impressed. So, so, I, was, so I was able to do that. Because so, sometimes if, if the host has gone offline, you're stuffed. Because at least, because I suddenly realised, okay, she's disappeared. Hang on, I appear to actually have control. I can actually turn turn things on and off. So I just thought, well, we, I, mean, I, think, I think I gave, I guess I gave you sort of five minutes to see if you would reappear, and you had. And I thought, well, okay, let's get on with it. It's really good, you know. That's why you're a professor. <laughs> yeah, so you know, we've, you know, we've been doing this kind of thing, but and I'm now realizing that you know, what limit, you know, limitation, how how Zoom sort of works. So. Uh, Anyway, well, that's great. I thought that I thought that because I had gone and I was the host, that maybe you had all gone and I didn't know what you were going to be well, doing. Well, that was the thing because it suddenly said me because when you disappeared, mm. you, you froze and disappeared. Then suddenly it says you're a host. So obviously you'd set me up as joint host. So when you luckily, fell away, luckily that worked out all, all right. <laughs> it's worth well bearing in mind that for future reference, that actually it is a it's a good failsafe as well as everything else.
Excellent. I'm glad that all worked out. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I think that's, I think that's us done. I think everyone got, did get their questions in. So there's, I don't know if you can see the chat box. Everyone's like, thanks so much. Thanks so much. Great lecture. Brilliant. Really enjoyed it. So yes, I can see it. So I've just, just pulled it up. All very much appreciate it, Aidan. Thank you so much. Right. And, uh, don't forget, we've got another um, excellent lecture coming up. We've got two more Egyptology lectures coming up, one with Dr. Campbell Price and uh, who's, always a, who's always good value always good value and dr paul harrison as well mm -hmm. so um yeah i'm sure he's going to get stuck into the car and bar business because he's more kind of like esoteric occult secret side of egypt and also he's done a lot of research into cometicism the sort of resurgence of interest in mm -hmm. ancient egyptian religion so that should be an interesting one absolutely yeah right okay good night everybody um bye now i go and have my dinner i think Excellent. Where you are in the world. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you for organising this. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, Aidan. See you soon. Yeah. Enjoy your dinner. Bye. Bye. Goodbye.